What's up smart homers? My name is Aaron. In today's video, we're going to be doing the ultimate temperature sensor comparison. In a few of the videos in my ultimate review series, we've looked at multi sensors, which are motion or contact sensors that have other sensors all in one device. However, these devices can get a little pricey and sometimes you just want to have a sensor for measuring temperature without the extras. Previously, I've looked at smart buttons and smart plugs, motion sensors and contact sensors. And in today's video, I'm going to be doing the same thing, but with temperature and humidity sensors. Anyway, I bought a bunch of different temperature and humidity sensors from a few different brands and I'm going to compare their prices and features and let you know which ones I would recommend and which ones I wouldn't. I'll also try to give you an idea of how you can use these in your smart home. As always, we got to go over the requirements for my selection. First, they got to work with Home Assistant, of course. Second, they can't require any other hub than a Zigbee, Z-Wave, or Bluetooth radio. And lastly, they got to cost less than 50 bucks. For the Zigbee devices, I'm going to be using ZHA to add these to Home Assistant. For the Z-Wave devices, I'll be using Z-Wave JS. And for the Bluetooth Low Energy devices, I'll be using a custom integration from Hacks called Bluetooth Low Energy Monitor. Note that the no other hub requirement assumes that you have Zigbee, Z-Wave, and Bluetooth radios set up and working with Home Assistant. I did some basic testing with these devices by putting them into my refrigerator and my freezer to simulate large temperature swings and extreme temperatures. I'll get into this in more detail in the testing section of this video. Okay, so let's look at some Zigbee sensors. The first one is the Sonoff Temperature and Humidity Sensor. You would recognize this look anywhere. It has the same square sharp look with the chamfered corners that we've seen with all of Sonoff's devices. In fact, this sensor looks almost identical to the Sonoff smart button that we've looked at previously. You actually couldn't tell the difference from a distance unless you saw the thermometer icon in the front. It has a little button on the bottom for pairing and on the top it has a few vent holes that allow the ambient air to reach the sensor. That's actually something you're going to see with most of the sensors in this video. It comes with adhesive backing as the only mounting option. It's a little tough to open even with a screwdriver, but when you do, you're going to see the battery. And if you remove the battery isolator, you can close it back up and then hold the pairing button down for a few seconds to put it into pairing mode. In Home Assistant, it shows up with the temperature and humidity sensors, as well as a battery level entity. For my testing, it seems to have a decent response time to large temperature swings, like when I put it in my refrigerator, and I'll get into these results a little bit later in the video. Next, we have the Acara temperature and humidity sensor. This sensor is the smallest of all the ones we're going to look at by volume. That small size is going to be important, which I'll explain a little bit later. It actually looks very similar in size and shape to the vibration sensor and the smart button that they also make. It has a clean, modern look, a white body with gray accents, and has a thermometer symbol on the front that's very similar to the Sonoff. It comes with an adhesive ring that can be used to mount the sensor to a surface. The only thing I don't like about this sensor is that the holes for ambient air are located on the bottom of the device, meaning that if you stand the device up on its end, then those holes are blocked. And I think that's going to affect the accuracy of your measurements. This hasn't been a big deal for me since I have most of them mounted with adhesive, but it is something to consider if you want to have something you can just set on a shelf. To put it into pairing mode, just pull the battery isolator tab and then hold the pairing button for a couple of seconds. In Home Assistant, it shows up with temperature and humidity sensors as well as the battery level entity. From my testing, this sensor has the best reaction time of all the sensors to large temperature swings. Again, I'm going to get into this kind of information in the testing section of this video. The sensor looks great aesthetically, so it's a good choice to use in locations where it's visible. I use one of these in my bathroom to turn on the exhaust fan when it reaches a certain level of humidity. All right, the next one is the Acara air quality monitor. Technically, this one might be considered a multi-sensor, so maybe it shouldn't be on the list, but I really wanted to get a chance to get my hands on one, so this was a good excuse to buy one. This device measures temperature, relative humidity, and the total volatile organic compounds, or TVOC, in the air. 
Probably my favorite feature about this device is the e-ink display. E-ink displays are awesome because they provide a high contrast screen that you can easily see, but they don't require a lot of battery. There are actually three different display configurations that you can cycle through on this device by double tapping the button that's on the top. In typical Acara style, this device has a white body with a gray back, which can be removed to expose the batteries. This device has two CR2450 batteries in it, so the battery life should be phenomenal. The holes for the ambient air are located on the sides of the device instead of on the bottom, which I think is much better. This device can be mounted either with a provided magnet or the provided adhesive. To pair the sensor, just pull the two battery isolator tabs and then hold the pairing button on the top for a few seconds. In Home Assistant, you get the temperature, humidity, and VOC level in parts per billion. That's the volatile organic compounds. The high contrast display makes this a great sensor to use if you want to quickly glance at the temperature or the air quality in the room. A good use for this could be in a baby's room where you want to keep an eye on the temperature more than in other rooms in the house. A quick glance can tell you if it's too warm, or too cold, too dry, or if you need better ventilation in the room. One of the problems I had with this device is that it displays the temperature in Celsius rather than in Freedom units, and there's no way to switch between the two without getting the Acara hub and without setting up an Acara account. To me, this is an issue, and it's a step away from complete local control and toward cloud-locked features. This would probably be fine for literally everyone except for people who live in the US. The other more concerning problem that I ran into was that this device dropped out several times and I had to restore it by removing the device and repairing it. This device had been sitting in my office only about five feet away from my Zigbee radio. To me, this issue is kind of unacceptable. Okay, so next we have the central light temperature and humidity sensor. This sensor is pretty hefty, much thicker and chunkier feeling than the Acara sensor. At first I wondered why, because in a previous video, I looked at the central light contact sensor, which also had a temperature sensor inside of it, and it was smaller than this one. Popping the cover open, you can see right away why it's so big. It has a big old CR2 battery inside. This should give the sensor pretty decent battery life, but it could also be a problem because CR2 batteries aren't very common in smart home sensors. Anyway, it has an array of ambient air holes on the front, which gives it a distinctive central light look and it has a gray thermometer icon on the front, which apparently is a requirement for all temperature sensors. The sensor can be mounted with adhesive, but it also has a slotted hole on the back that can be used to mount it with a screw or a nail. To put the device into pairing mode, pull the battery isolator tab, and in Home Assistant, you're gonna get the temperature, humidity, and battery sensors. Okay, that's it for the Zigbee sensors. Let's move on to some Z-Wave devices. The first one is the AOTEC AirQ sensor. This sensor is pretty small. Maybe it's a little bit larger than the Acara sensor by volume. It has a round button in the center of its face with an LED indicator behind it. It has a gap around the edges of the button, which I assume allows the ambient air to reach the sensors. Inside has temperature and humidity sensors, and it uses these values to calculate the dew point. If you pop off the back cover, you can see that this sensor uses a CR2477 battery, another battery that's not very common in smart home sensors from what I've seen. To pair the device, remove the battery isolator tab, which is a little hard to grab. I ended up taking the battery right out so that I could get that isolator out. Put the cover back on and then triple press the button on the face of the device. So here's where I ran into some trouble. The device took an extremely long time to pair in S2 security mode, and when it did, there were no configuration options. I conducted a bunch of testing with all the different sensors, then I finally realized that maybe I should try pairing it in non-security mode. When I did, then the configuration options showed up. There's something really weird about this, but it could be a problem with Z-Wave JS. It took me about four tries to finally get this thing paired. In Home Assistant, you get temperature, dew point, humidity, overheat, underheat, and moisture sensors, as well as battery level, low battery, and replace battery sensors. The configuration options, when included properly, give you a wide range of options, including temperature and humidity reporting thresholds, refresh rate, temperature units, and much more. 
It's important to note that the dew point sensor is not a separate sensor, but is really just calculated using the actual physical sensors in the device. All right, the next Z-Wave sensor is the Zoos XS temperature and humidity sensor. This sensor has to be the most nondescript of any of the sensors we're looking at. It has a thin rectangular body with no marking of any kind on the front. And it actually looks very similar to the Zoos contact sensor that I've reviewed in previous videos, as well as the Zoos vibration sensor that they also sell. The back has a bunch of information about the sensor and the bottom has those ventilation holes for temperature and humidity sensing purposes. The back also shows that the sensor needs to be installed with the vents facing down. This could present a problem if you want to rest the bottom of the sensor on a flat surface, but it does come with adhesive pad for mounting purposes. If you pop off the cover, you'll see a 2450 battery with a battery isolator, and you'll also see a pairing button on the PCB. Remove the isolator and then triple press the pairing button to put it into inclusion mode. In Home Assistant, you get air temperature, humidity, overheat, underheat, moisture, battery level, and low battery level sensors. Similar to the AirQ, the Zeus sensor has a ton of configuration options, including report thresholds for battery temperature and humidity, overheat and underheat thresholds, temperature scale, temperature and humidity offsets, and temperature and humidity reporting intervals. The sensor has a slim profile, which can make it very useful up against trim or other locations where it can be tucked away, but still in sight. During my testing, I did find that the device stopped working when I put it into my chest freezer, but that's kind of what happens when you put a Z-Wave device in a metal box. I'm not sure if it was the metal freezer that actually did it or if it was the cold, but it's something that's noteworthy. Okay, next we're gonna look at Bluetooth low energy devices. Before I started researching for this video, I hadn't used Bluetooth devices in Home Assistant because I have a Home Assistant Blue for my main setup and it doesn't natively have a Bluetooth radio. However, someone on YouTube suggested that I really take a look at Bluetooth low energy sensors because of their cost as well as their performance and how well they work with Home Assistant. My test setup is with a Raspberry Pi 4 that has Bluetooth built in, so I decided to take a look at some of these. I also picked up a Bluetooth adapter and a USB extender for my Home Assistant Blue, so if I like these sensors, I can use them on my main setup. To connect these devices to Home Assistant, I used a Home Assistant Community Store custom integration called Bluetooth Low Energy Monitor. There is a native integration called Bluetooth Low Energy Tracker in Home Assistant, but as I understand it, this custom integration works better, especially for the devices I'm gonna be testing. The first Bluetooth sensor I'm gonna be looking at is the Xiaomi temperature and humidity sensor. This sensor is the cheapest of all the devices we're gonna look at in this video, and it's actually become pretty popular among the DIYers of the Home Assistant community. The device has a very small footprint, only a little larger than the Acara sensor, and it comes with a digital display. The display has both temperature and humidity readings on it, and although it seems pretty cheap, it's readable from a short distance away without issue. It comes with a small adhesive pad for mounting purposes, but can also stand on its edge. Connecting the sensor to Home Assistant is not as straightforward as the rest of the Bluetooth sensors we're gonna be talking about in this video. You actually have to connect this one to the Xiaomi Mi Home app first, and there you can change the temperature scale and some other settings if you want to. And once you do that, you have to use a special web program to ob obtain a device key and then enter that key in Home Assistant in the setup. Then you gotta wait about 10 or 15 minutes for the device to show up. If you wanna know how to add this to Home Assistant, I'll leave a link to a video that I've followed in the description. In Home Assistant, you get the temperature, humidity, and battery sensors, as well as RSSI and voltage entities. For my testing, both at ambient temperatures and in my refrigerator and freezer, the Xiaomi remained within one degree of the Acara at all times. The only major difference between this one and the Acara, it was the reporting frequency. The Xiaomi reported much less often than the Acara and more erratically. As I understand it, the Xiaomi can be flashed with custom firmware and you can change that reporting interval, but I'm not gonna mess with that. I want something that works fairly easily off the shelf. The only time this reporting frequency would be a problem for me is if I was trying to track large and immediate temperature swings. The next device is the Govi 5174 or the Govi Lanyard as I call it. This one has a really unique look to it, being the largest sensor we've covered so far. It has a glossy finish on the front and a matte finish 
on the rest of the body. It really has a quality feel to it with a nice weight when you hold it in your hand. The sensor has a thermometer symbol on the front, but this symbol has an LED indicator behind it and it flashes blue when the sensor is communicating. It actually looks really cool. It also has a hole in it that allows the ambient air to reach the inside. If you pop the back cover off, you can see that it's powered by three AAA batteries, which is why the sensor body is so big. It also comes with a lanyard that can be installed with a bit of difficulty so that the device can be hung by it. This might come in handy if you have a greenhouse or some outdoor building that you want to monitor the temperature and humidity only during certain times of year. You can just hang the lanyard on a nail or a hook and then you can remove it when you're done. Sometimes a temporary mount is better than a permanent one. To add the device to Home Assistant, you'll need to pull the battery isolator tab and then find it in the passive BLE monitor integration. In Home Assistant, you get the temperature, humidity, and battery sensors, as well as an RSSI entity. For my testing, the Gobi sensor was typically within one to two degrees higher than the Acara sensor pretty consistently. It also took a bit longer to adjust to abrupt temperature swings than the Acara did. And I'll show that a little bit more in my testing section. The next one is the Govi H5075, or what I call the Govi Digital. This is a larger device with a digital display that shows the temperature and humidity, as well as the minimum and maximum values. The screen isn't the greatest, but it's pretty big, so you can get a good look at temperature from some distance away. The top of the sensor has a button that you can press to change the temperature scale if you want to, and the back has a little kickstand that can be pulled out so it can stand up on a flat surface. It also has a slotted hole for a nail or screw so it can be mounted to a wall. If you open up the battery hatch, you'll see that it takes two AAA batteries. To add the device to Home Assistant, install the batteries and then find it in the passive Bluetooth Low Energy Monitor integration. In Home Assistant, you get the temperature, humidity, and battery sensors, as well as an RSSI entity. The standout feature to me for this device is the price. You get a large display and a decent working temperature range for a very low price. This device performed in line with the Acara and the other devices at room temperature, but during my freezer test, it reported temperatures consistently about two degrees lower than the rest. One more note on Govi before we move on. Govi has a ton of different sensors and multiple that look very similar to the Govi lanyard that we looked at in this video. I can't say if the Govi lanyard and Govi digital are representative of all the other devices that are similar that Govi makes, but based on my testing of both of them, I would say that they're a great option and it's worth exploring all the other sensors that they sell. Okay, so the last sensor we're gonna look at is the Inkbird IBS TH2 temperature and humidity sensor. Inkbird has a line of temperature and humidity sensors, at least two of which work with Home Assistant. Of all the sensors, I really like the look of this one the best. It has a clean matte white finish with a distinctive hole in the upper right corner that goes all the way through the body of the sensor. You could actually put a lanyard through it if you wanted or just hang it right on a nail. It also has a magnetic back, so it can be attached to a magnetic surface, like your fridge. In the upper left corner, it has a hole that allows the air to reach the sensor inside. It has the brand name written on the front, and on the back, you can see a battery hatch. Using the provided screwdriver, you can open the battery hatch and then install two AAA batteries. To add the device to Home Assistant, once again, you need to find it in the passive BLE monitor integration. In Home Assistant, you get the temperature, humidity and battery sensors, as well as an RSSI entity. What makes this sensor special to me besides the good looks is the operating temperature range, which is the widest range of all the sensors we're looking at in this video. This makes it an excellent choice to put it into your refrigerator or your freezer if you wanna monitor the temperature. Okay, so now let's look at the testing that I did. One thing I noticed right off was that when active scanning is enabled in the BLE integration that I used, the Bluetooth sensors had a higher sampling rate than any of the other sensors. I understand that this can drain battery, but I'm gonna show you the battery percentages after a month of use later on. Another thing that I noticed was that the Inkbird sensor seems to read maybe a degree or two higher than the other sensors a lot of the time. The first test I did was to place all of the sensors into my refrigerator. I noticed that the Acara sensor had the fastest response time to the sudden swing in temperature. I'm thinking that this is because of how small it is. The more mass a device's body has, the more heat it can hold, 
and then the longer that heat is gonna to take to dissipate. The Zeus was the next most responsive here. And if you look at the Zeus, it is pretty lightweight. It doesn't have a lot of mass. The rest of the devices took a little longer to reach steady state temperature in the fridge. Another thing I noticed in this test was that the AOTech and the Xiaomi devices both have pretty large refresh rates. And it shows when there's a sudden change in temperature. The AOTech rate can be changed in the configuration settings, but unfortunately the Xiaomi can't at least not without flashing new firmware. Again, when warming back up to room temperature, the Akara and the Zoos responded the quickest. While in the fridge, the temperature readings were all within two degrees of each other, the Inkbird being the highest and the Akara being the lowest. The next test I did was to put all of the sensors that are rated for low temperatures into my chest freezer. This includes the Akara temperature and humidity, the two Govi devices, and the Inkbird. Once again, the Akara responded the quickest, and this time there's about three degrees difference between them. The Govi with the digital display reported the lowest temperature while the Inkbird reported the highest. Next, at a risk of damaging them, I went ahead and put all of the sensors into the freezer. Right away, you can see that the Zoos and the Xiaomi had trouble communicating. The Zoos must have been having trouble because of the metal chest freezer, I'm guessing. Maybe it was the cold, but it's interesting that the AOTech, which is also a Z-Wave device, didn't have this problem. At steady state in the freezer, there is a temperature cycling that occurs approximately every 25 minutes or so. I was actually able to confirm that this matches up with the power usage cycling of the chest freezer using a power monitoring plug. Because of the temperature sampling thresholds and the sampling rate, the Zigbee devices weren't really able to capture the cycling except for the Akara temperature and humidity sensor. Weirdly, after the freezer test, I noticed that the Inkbird temperature sensor was reading significantly higher than the other sensors, and it was higher in comparison than it had been before the freezer test. I was a little bit worried that I had damaged the sensor, and then I realized that when I brought it back and put it back where I had it before the test, I laid it on its back rather than standing it up on its end. When I stood it back up, the temperature came back down like it had been before. I suppose that maybe the desktop was adding some heat to the sensor because more of the surface area of the body of the sensor was touching the desk. During many of these tests, I use a mineral spirit thermometer to measure the actual temperature and kind of compare it with what the sensors were reading. Based on what I saw, it looked like the central light and the Akara temperature and humidity sensor were the most accurate. But I really wouldn't put too much faith in these results because you're eyeballing it with a thermometer like this. Lastly, I included a few different sensors and smart devices that measure temperature that I've covered in previous videos so you guys can kind of get an idea of how they compare. In particular, I chose the Zeus Q sensor, the Philips Hue motion sensor, the Akara motion sensor, the smart things button, and the SwitchBot meter. Based on my comparisons, the SwitchBot meter and smart things button perform well with measurements that fall in line with all the other sensors. The Akara motion sensors temperature swings all over the place, and it really doesn't give an accurate representation of the air temperature at that time at all. In its defense, the temperature sensor is really called the device temperature in Home Assistant, and it's listed in the diagnostic sections of the device information. There's really no way for the ambient air to reach the sensor on this one, so it really couldn't measure the true ambient air temperature. The Zoo's Q sensor was likewise pretty inaccurate, typically about three degrees below the average of the other sensors. And even though it is a Z-Wave device, none of the configuration options allow for a temperature offset. The Philips Hue sensor was by far the most inaccurate, reading five degrees below the actual temperature of the room. A valuable lesson that we can take away from this is that when a company is making a sensor, there's probably one primary sensor that they're gonna spend the most on, and there's gonna be some auxiliary sensors that are not nearly as accurate. If there's no way to calibrate those sensors, it's better you just buy a separate sensor dedicated to what the auxiliary sensor was gonna do. So let's look at the battery percentages after a month of use. You can see right away that most of them are still at 100% battery, so there isn't much comparison we can do, but we can see that the Govi Digital seems to have drained a little bit in battery. Likewise, the Zeus sensor also has a lower battery, but by far the lowest is the Akara temperature and humidity sensor. To be fair, when I added this device to Home Assistant, it had a low battery already. It came that way from the manufacturer. And like I've said before, I don't trust battery tests. Finally, comparing humidity, I have really nothing conclusive on this. I have no way 
to know what the true humidity in the room is. I didn't want to do any calibrated humidity sensors or anything like that. So I'll just show this comparison and take from it what you will. Pretty much the humidity ranged a lot between the different sensors. The two Govies, the Akara temperature and humidity, and the central light were all pretty similar. And then the Inkbird, Sonoff, and Aotech were all closer together by themselves. Anyway, that's all the testing I did. I really appreciate you guys sticking around to the end. Now, let's take a look at which ones I would recommend and which ones I wouldn't. I really like the Bluetooth Low Energy devices because of their high sample rate and their low price. Of all the Bluetooth Low Energy sensors, my favorite has to be the Inkbird temperature and humidity sensor. Because of how good it looks, and also because it has that magnetic mounting option. On top of that, it's got a great working temperature range, better than all the rest. Although I did find that weird temperature variation when it was lying on its back, I still wouldn't be afraid to use this sensor to monitor the temperature in my refrigerator or my freezer. The best Zigbee sensor, and the sensor that responded quickest to large temperature swings was the Akara temperature and humidity sensor. To me, it's really good looking, it's modern and it's sleek, and I would definitely recommend it if you're looking for a cheap Zigbee sensor. I have a bunch of these throughout my house and I've not been disappointed. If you're looking for a Z-Wave sensor, it's a close call, but I would recommend the Zoos over the Aotech. The difficulty I had pairing the Aotech combined with the fact that the Zoos has better configuration options makes the Zoos a better deal in my opinion. The Zoos allows you to set a temperature offset if you want to calibrate it, which the Aotech doesn't, and it also allows you to set a temperature reporting frequency that's lower than what the Aotech can. I also just think the Zoos looks better. If you're looking for a sensor to put in your freezer, I'd recommend either the Govi Lanyard or the Inkbird. Both are rated for those low temperatures and both have AAA batteries, so should last for a while. If you're looking for a sensor with a screen, the Xiaomi looks really good, but I'm just gonna warn you, it is a real pain to get going with Home Assistant. This is actually the reason it's gonna be on my list of least favorites as well. So here are the ones that I would not recommend. The first one, as I already mentioned, is the Xiaomi Bluetooth sensor. Yes, the price was low, but I'm not sure if it justifies the other issues. Not only is the sample rate fairly low, but if you wanna change the temperature, units on the display, you have to do it in the Xiaomi Mi app. And if you remove the battery, it goes back to the default, Celsius. That's a deal breaker for me, because that means that every time I gotta change the battery, I then have to add it to the Xiaomi Mi Home app, change the temperature units, and then go ahead and do the whole process of adding it to Home Assistant again. The next one that I would not recommend is the Akara Air Quality Monitor. If you need to have a device that measures the total volatile organic compounds in the air, then sure, this device might be good. But if you're just looking for temperature and humidity, I'd stay away. Despite its amazing e-ink screen, in the month that I used it, it disconnected three or four times and I had to repair it with ZHA. That's far too unstable in my opinion and the price doesn't justify it if you're looking for a temperature sensor. Anyway, I hope this video gives you a good idea of what temperature sensors are out there that work for Home Assistant. And I also hope it gives you enough information to kind of make a choice as to what sensor is best for your smart home. There are so many other Bluetooth devices out there that work with this Home Assistant integration that I use that I could not cover them all, but I hope you can at least get a good idea of how they perform. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a like to help with the algorithm and whatnot. And let me know in the comments if you've had different experiences with these sensors or if you have cool ways that you've used these sensors. Also, I'll be doing more reviews like this as well as guides and automation idea videos. So if you're interested, please consider subscribing. Also, if you're already subscribed, keep an eye out for community posts because I often like to ask you guys what sensors and device that you use in your smart home because it really helps me have a well-rounded group of devices for comparison. Anyway, thanks for watching. See ya.